when we go around and introduce folks. Uh, for some of you, you're meeting some of our newer staff for the first time. Uh, for some of you, <laughs> you've known each other for uh, 25 uh, or more years. I, I think that's very important uh, because we're all doing the same work and I know that it's helpful if you see a face of somebody that you're dealing with day in and day out. And we've tried to do that with our support staff trainings uh, over the years. We're really pleased to be providing this training. Uh, we uh, uh, will be doing it over the course of the uh, next few months. Uh, we want to uh, stress to you uh, that you are very valuable employees of the Department of Human Services. Uh, your contributions are immeasurable to the success of the agency. I think too often uh, you may get an indication or a feeling that you're taking for granted. Uh, you absolutely are not. You are very valued employees. For those of you that have known me for uh, a long time, uh, you know that every time I talk to uh, uh, support staff, I talk about customer service. Um, customer service is uh, his job one in our division. And the reason I always mention it to you folks is because you're oftentimes the first contact. You are the face of the agency to hundreds and hundreds of people who are experiencing difficulties in their lives uh, when they come to the agency. They're often the, you're often the first person they see or the first person that uh, from the agency that talks to them. And you leave an impression on them, and I've let you know that over the years. And uh, when I call your offices, I continue to be impressed at how warmly you receive anyone calling in on the phone, whether it be the director or somebody calling in for an appointment. So as the people in, on the front line, you do leave that important first impression. I want to thank you for uh, leaving a good impression. And I just, again, want to tell you, you do really good work. And uh, uh, my advice to you is keep it up. Enjoy the training. Okay. Thanks, Gray. Bernie, did you have any comments no. you want to make? No, I'm just okay. here for a couple more minutes. I okay. have to leave. Um, we have a full agenda today, so prior to introducing the presenters, um, we may or may not get through this whole agenda, but I just want you to be aware to um, take the time you need to ask questions so that you fully understand the, um, the training topics that we have today. Um, if we don't get all of these covered today, we can certainly um, ask Lloyd and Melissa and Ellen um, to um, come back at a later date. So please ask any questions that you have of these staff while we have them available. Um, to start out, we have Lloyd Johnson with us, and he is new to our department, but not new to state government. Um, Lloyd has been in state government. Uh, he began his career in 1984 as an internal auditor in the Department of Health. During the past 27 years, Lloyd has worked in the accounting field in several agencies, including the Bureau of Finance and Management, State Auditor's Office, and most recently, the State Treasurer's Office. He joined the Department of Human Services in January of 2011, so just months. Yeah, almost a year. <laughs> As the Assistant Director of Budget and Finance. And he assumed the additional duties of Accounts Payable Manager and Budget Manager in July of 2011. Um, so, welcome, Lloyd. And beside him is Melissa Antejunti. Did I pronounce that right? Antejunti. Hi. She's got a hard last name. <laughs> <laughs> she's a senior claims clerk, and she's been with the department for five years. And she also works with, um, what other thing do you do? Accounts payable, correct? Yes. Okay. Yes. And also with us, I don't think I need to introduce Ellen. Everyone knows Ellen except for the new folks. Ellen's been in state government for over 40 years, um, and she, her duties include um, VR faces, and she's a data control clerk. 
So welcome everyone, and I think we're going to turn it over to Lloyd, but before we do, we're going to hit our start button to record, or did you already It's going. It? It's going. Good. Okay, Lloyd. Well, it's great to be here today. A lot of uh, names that I've heard in the last year, that now I just get to see the faces too. It's uh, nice to at least put a face to you, and maybe somebody I'll get out in the field and come visit you uh, directly. But today's uh, Department of Human Services financial training is going to encompass mainly the VR faces section as well as the accounts payable section. And just a little bit about our Division of Budget and Finance, our director, John Hansen, who you may, have, I'm sure most of you have met that have been here for some time, is our division director. I'm the assistant. We have the accounts payable section that has a vacancy right now, the accounting assistant position. Then we have uh, Ellen and Melissa also on the accounts payable side. We also have the uh, contract section which is headed up by Nick Cotton and he has two employees with him uh, Alan Fickbaum who is in charge of grants and Jessica Bardison who does audits and she does some of the same audits that I did as internal auditor in 1984 for the Department of Health so I thought that was kind of interesting when I came over here so um, we also have a couple other ones that you may never run into we have two uh, accounting people over at the South Dakota Developmental Center and that would be the whole division of budget and finance that we have. So now let's get down to business here. Let's talk a little bit about VR faces uh, and the payment processing. I know that there's a lot of experience out there in all the rooms across the state today and most of you know much more than I do and that's why we have Ellen here on the VR faces side today. If you guys have any questions, I'm not sure how it works with this format, if you just unmute mute and ask a question um, feel free to ask a question at any time. I'm not going to be going into great depth on some of this, but uh, if you have questions that we haven't been hitting, make sure you get those ad asked today. So first of all, on the um, VR faces, we're going to go into obtaining a rate for a CPT code. And as most of you are familiar, the main way to get that rate, and it's a little bit different than the... Do you have uh, a handout that you want to reference on well, this? The, just the uh, VR faces payment processing, just the uh, agenda for the day. Okay. But we'll be going into that. Um, main way is through the mainframe, through, through SW95. And it, in talking, Eric did a little check, and it looks like you guys only have access to the HCPC. If anybody uh, can confirm that. And we'll quick have Ellen run into there right now if you want. For everyone's information, we'll be switching back and forth between the, the view of the different sites and then the uh, view of, of the laptop with the different uh, items that we'll be talking about throughout the day. Go ahead. Should I just put any one in now? Sure. Go ahead and narrate if you want to, Ellen, if you would. Okay. Um, the, we're going to use 99204. And the first thing you'll see is where it says the procedure name is the office outpatient visit new. And then it, where it says nomenclature, it says, um, it basically describes what the office visit should contain. Um, for the amount of the CPT code, you will notice at the bottom of the screen you'll say you'll see outpatient maximum allowable maximum charges you take the maximum charges and the most current date which would be 7 1 2008 for hundred and seven dollars and eighty one cents and that would be your um, amount that you pay unless the charges are less on the bill And I guess that's it. And if, um, let's try another CPT, um, 66984, which is for cataract surgery. Um, for the facility fee, 
that would be your outpatient maximum allowable, which would be $452. And the regular CPT amount would be $613.52. So the, 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 max, the outpatient max allow and the maximum charges, those are both Medicaid rates, right? Right. Okay. Okay, I'd just like to also point out is that um, if you have any trouble with this, there is also underneath the Appendix G that Janet had emailed out to everybody. That's basically, there is no Appendix G anymore. The Appendix G was taken over by this mainframe session through uh, Department of Social Services. And so you can refer to that. Or as always, um, feel free to call Ellen or myself and we can help you through it. Now, uh, if I may, Ellen, sometimes there isn't an amount that appears under the Medicaid amount. Is that true? Right. And if there's no amount in that column under the Medicaid maximum charges, you will have to go to your payment book, which is Appendix A, B, C, D, and E. And then if you cannot find it there, you'll have to call in and we can try and find a comparable code and figure up the price on it. The uh, there's a Medicare maximum there too. That would it, it for all the for all the those rates that we look up. That right. would, that would be the second one that we would go to. Is that right? If there's not a Medicaid rate, don't we go right. to the, the Medicare rate? Right, is which is the Medicare maximum would be on those appendix. Oh, it, is this is this a better resource though for Medicare rate? Yes. Okay. Can use that. All right. And then if it's not there, then go to the mm -hmm. appendixes. Okay. All right. All right. We had Nick Cotton update the all the appendices except for E, and on all those A, B, C, and D, um, I had Janet send those out, and they have the new rates in them. So uh, we're not going to go through those today, but they are available in the last handout that Janet had sent out. If you have any questions on those, make sure you give us a, either speak up now or uh, give us a call. Lloyd, now this you. is Peggy Yankton. Yep. Um, Bernie had sent, hi, Bernie sent an email and uh, said something about putting it on a drive. Is it possible to put like on the M drive, then you would have access to that way rather than having paper? Yeah, right. you bet. Uh, this is Eric. I think I think his instructions were his suggestion was to take those uh, attachments that came by email and put them on a common drive in your office, like on on your N drive, so that you know, so that you and and any other support staff or anyone else in your office can access the same same document electronically. Peg, do you have any access to the drives here in Pier? Or any of our drives? Well, the, the only the only uh, the only no. drive that they would have access to is the M drive, at okay. M as in Mary, and, yep. and that one is is Short only term. only accessible if you request from BIT and put a add a list of names to it, and that's um, that, that's a hassle. I, I don't personally I don't think is necessary. Okay. I think if any if if every office just designates a spot on their local end drive and as a Nancy to put put those attachments um, that would be the best way to go about things right for those in our building I do have it on an end common drive that they can all get to right now right and we can talk to your supervisor about that too Peg and see what drive they want to have that out there on okay good question this this is Connie in Sioux Falls um, we've worked a lot recently with that CPT code, and we're finding more and more there's a modifier on that one, which brings it down again. Right. And sometimes um, those mod. Are you talking, Connie? Are you talking about the the cataract surgery, the specific one that the she's six, looking six, at? The six six nine eight four. I'm going to yeah. switch it back to that. Can you can you okay. explain, Ellen? Um, the, the modifiers would be found in Appendix e. e. No. Yeah. Yeah. E. No, that's F. The F. Modifiers are found in Appendix F, 
which is not being updated because there are no changes. And if the CPT code has a modifier, you take the percentage that it says in under the modifier, let's say like 20, if it had a modifier 26, then you'd take, I think it's 40% if it's um, not um, laboratory, and if it's laboratory, it's another percentage, I can't remember, um, of the Medicaid amount, mm -hmm. which would bring it down a little bit more than the 613.52. So instead of 613.52, it's a percentage of that. Right. Okay. And then if they have like um, two modifiers, you take the first percentage and then that amount and then times another percent and that would bring it down more. But some modifiers are just informational like modifier 79 and when that's there you don't have to do a percentage. It's just the flat fee. This is Lloyd here. I'm wondering if uh, we need to get something a little more detailed in writing out to you guys on that if we don't have that already. It happens to be an appendix that I didn't touch. Yeah. It's out there. So it's under the app appendix? Yeah. And that's not updated this year because there weren't any changes. How does uh, somebody out in the regional office that looks up this code for 613.52 know that there's modifiers. Because on the bill, the 1500 form, it will have the CPT code and then the modifier after it. Okay. So the, the if I may, the, the payment then, the payment that you make on a bill is just the, 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 the CPT rate and the modifier are all driven, the, 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 the facility gives you that information. Right, right. right. Okay. And the facility will know there's a modifier out there. Right. Okay. Yep. Because they have to have it if they're billing it to the, I'm wondering if anybody. So when the facility no. has that modifier on the so. bill and you put that they number they go into effect right away or July? No. Did we have some other questions out there? <clears throat> in July. The new one you mailed out, you, you sent over the email that we printed off. Do they go into effect now or in July? I believe they went into first effect January 1st, didn't they? Yes. January 1st of 2012. Okay, thank you. You bet? Okay. Good question. Um, some of the things uh, Ellen has on a little list, I don't know if she wants to go through those about VR faces, what to watch for. Um, it'd be the uh, oh, you want to bring up that one? That's VR faces watch list 2012. Eric and Ellen, I'll let them kind of take charge of this as far as Have you seen that? these would be loaded into, you can only choose what's already in VR Faces, I believe, is that correct? For the, for the select the correct fund source. Oh, yes. Um, you know, just uh, r real briefly, um, the fund sources are, you know, um, whatever Rhonda inputs for DRS and whatever I input for SBVI. And uh, we take our lead from fiscal when it comes to, you know, using up that year's funds and, and adding another year's funds. Um, and, uh, you know, <laughs> unfortunately, I don't, I'm not always the best at what those, those fund sources all have a, an ending date and sometimes the end date will come and go uh, before I realize that it's not out there anymore. So I appreciate you guys. If you don't see a fun source that's out there, I, I appreciate you letting me know.
Um, and I've recently made some attempts to try to be a little more organized with those end dates as well. So, um, <laughs> Ellen and, and Lloyd, this is a this is a document that you just developed recently, correct? I think Ellen uh, has had this before. Over the years. A different version. Yeah. Though, maybe. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, mental health rates. I know there's been several questions in the last couple weeks about mental health rates because they um, they have dropped from twenty nine dollars to twenty seven sixty nine or something like that. Um, and I think. Um, like Human Services Agency, Northeastern Mental Health Center, all the mental health centers should be using the 2769. Um, but um, if they're a private individual, I guess Bernie was going to take it case by case so we wouldn't lose any vendors. Uh, not a fac not, not, the not one of the mental health. Providers, but not one of the mental health centers. But right, but a pro, uh, private. Oh, okay. Ellen, this is Peg. Do we still use the twenty nine dollars a month then, or an hour, a unit, a unit? Sorry, for the private psychologists and stuff. Or they need to run that through Bernie. You need to run that through Bernie. If they're requesting more okay. than that, you would yeah. need. No, they're they're just still using the twenty nine dollars that we were you know using for the mental health center rate. Uh, I, I, we'll get clarification on that too uh, and send that out. I would say with as with the other uh, rates that we're talking about today, if they bill twenty nine dollars, then you can pay twenty nine dollars. You know what I mean, Rhonda? You're looking at me like. <laughs> She's telling me it's twenty seven sixty nine. Well, it's twenty seven sixty nine. I'm right. sorry. Even if, if they, they bill twenty nine dollars, we're only paying twenty seven sixty nine. Right. Right. Okay. Okay. For unless it, unless for, unless there's approval. Right. Unless yeah, there's okay. approval by Bernie. Yeah. And that's only for private providers. Right. Right. Um. Then you have to um, verify that the vendor is correct. Um, I know that Sanford has a lot of satellite offices, which is which is hard at sometimes to find which one is correct. But do your best, and if you get it wrong, I'll call you, <laughs> and we'll get it figured out. And. One more thing on the vendors, um, Eric and Janet asked me if there's a way that we could get you access to the vendor listing we have on the state level, and I'm still working on that right now. It's um, it's kind of a direct link to everybody's computer that's here in the building. Therefore, I'm not sure if they can give that. They can't give it just as an open item. We'd have to ask for everybody to be able to get into it. We're studying to see if that will be helpful in, in helping you find vendor numbers. This would be simply to, uh, in addition to what's on FACES, to identify if there's a vendor on the state system that is an honor. Correct. Mm -hmm. right. These people would be uh, maybe on the state system and not on FACES yet. Right. Yeah. Uh, W-9 has been filled out for. And we struggle with that here in the central office as well. I'm always going to to either Melissa or Ellen looking for vendor numbers and recently uh, Ellen and I worked on a vendor number for Mayo Clinic and St. Mary's Hospital in Minneapolis and that's a nightmare. How many different vendor numbers did we see out there Ellen? Lots. A lot. <laughs> so that may happen when you run into the bigger facilities like the big Sanford Hospital or Avera in Sioux Falls. So if you have questions, you know, just call one of us up here. Um, the next one is um, make sure the payment hasn't been made before. Um, sometimes when you send copies in uh, instead of the original, and then later on the original shows up, and then we pay it again under a different authorization. 
Uh, we, I have no way of knowing that. Um, so maybe try not to send copies of a bill for an original receipt. Um, but if you need to, make sure it hasn't been paid before. Um, so you will accept copies? Yes, I will accept copies, but just make darn sure that they haven't been paid before. Okay. Is there a way here through faces that they can see a similar payment for a similar amount? I imagine there are quite a few payments for the same amount. Mm -hmm. out of yeah, the and I, I don't know. Um, um, hopefully it's not happening that often. Um, if at all, um, but you must you must have seen it happen before, yes. uh, and I could I guess I can foresee an instance where you get a a faxed bill or or something that you ask for in a short period of time, and then and then the uh, without thinking of it a week later you get the original coming in, um, and and but I would think that it would be hard to um, there's not very often that you'd create another authorization after you get the bill in, correct? Well, it's happened, yeah. but... Well, I'm to answer your original question, Lloyd, everything on that authorization browse will show, um, you know, especially if you go into the detail of each one of those authorization authorizations, it will show the those payments that are made, so... And I'm just thinking of it while we're putting up things to watch for here, but uh, I notice very few vouchers that actually come back to the department, especially for the number of vouchers that we do here. I've worked in a lot smaller departments where we get just as many back, and that everybody's doing a really good job out there. We're just trying to touch on the items that could cause trouble, that we, you know, might be a good idea to watch. And don't want anybody to think we're kind of like coming down on you or anything right now. We're just trying to make this topics of discussion. Okay, um, verify the service dates. Uh, make sure the dates of service on the invoice or bill fall between the authorization begin and end dates. And also, um, another thing, if the invoice has an invoice number, please enter that on when you're making the payment. And also the date of the invoice, not the date you put it on the date of the invoice. Now, are these all things that once you've put it through the system, the auditors look at when they're making payments right. on them? So if some of these things are not correctly identified on here, the auditor's office may send them back. Is that correct, right. Ellen? Correct. So that's one of the reasons Ellen uh, would like to make sure that you guys are aware that all these are included on there is because once they leave her desk, they go up to the auditor's office and they may turn around and send it back to her because the correct the information is not correctly identified. So she's just preventing them being sent back to her. Right. Okay, and the next one is to ensure that all invoices that are referenced in a statement are included in the voucher packet sent for statement or payment. Um, make sure that if you're doing gas tickets that they're all listed on the statement and all the gas tickets are there. But if you don't have a statement, just do the tickets separate. Um, that's all for that. Um, before adding a vendor on VR Faces vendor file, verify the vendor does not already exist. This can be checked by the vendor name and tax ID number. You would also want to check, and you know, you want to search the active vendors, but you can also click the inactive vendors to check. And if they're out there, um, you know, you need to get a W nine. But instead of adding them all over again, you could just uncheck that inactive vendor flag. Then they'd be active again. You just need to be sure and get that W nine. Right. Mm -hmm. That's all I, got. All right, uh, I have one question before we move on with that. 
could there be a vendor on VR faces that potentially would not have a W nine in the state system? Is that something that needs to be checked? Or? Well, you could you could enter a vendor onto faces without it without them having a W nine in okay. place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, that, so so is that a concern of the staff out in the offices? Do they need to? check with the state office to make sure that vendor is also on the state system or do they, they usually send an email or call me and see if that vendor is on and if it's not then i always email them and get a w9 okay because otherwise it just stops at ellen and then they have to get a w9 before they can process that payment which okay. takes more time you know okay do any does anyone have any questions out there in the field offices the district offices before we move on All right, not hearing any questions, let's move on to the uh, invoice processing. It would be the accounts payable through the accounts payable system on the state accounting system. Do you have a handout you want to reference on that one? Or no? um, yes, the financial or the voucher checklist 2012. Okay. Help me find it. What? It says it's a PDF and example. Oops, we lost some of it. Where are we at? About number four. Right here. Yep. Mm -hmm. I should have numbered them that. Oh, okay, there we go. Alright, we'll probably just go to the example here. Examples right here. It's, on, it's down a little bit there. Going down? Oh, there we go. Okay. Uh, just highlighting, this is the same example that Denise gave out last time she visited with you guys. Nothing's really changed on it. Uh, just the number one box is your invoice number. If you have a service PO or anything like that, you can put that in there. Or the actual invoice number of the document. If there is no invoice on the document, then you can leave it blank and we'll, Melissa will put it on here when it gets here. Of course, number two is the date. That would be the date of the invoice. Is that the date we want in there, Melissa? Yes. Okay. Uh, this is the date of the invoice? Yes. Oh, I always did the date that I actually processed the payment. No, it should be the date of the invoice. But, but I, I check that and... I, I okay, that's something new to me. Yes. Date of invoice. Okay, if you have their vendor number, the state assigned vendor identification number, as opposed to their tax payer identification number, um, it goes into this slot number three there. Um, if you have a contract number that goes with that, I'm not really sure if you guys do a lot of the contract processing out there. Or most of yes, it. Yes, do, do. Okay, great. Put the contract number into the slot number four. Also, on the vendor number, please do not hesitate to get a hold of Ellen or I um, for a vendor number. Um, it's so that way you can keep it on your templates and, and have that all the time. Because it's, I mean, if it's done beforehand, then you know we don't have to go back through, we can just get the processing those are the, the that's an, always an eight digit number isn't it nine, isn't it? That nine. Eight. Eight. Oh yeah eight, 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 eight. but sometimes that, the, the, the sign number by the state is eight. yeah yeah group numbers sometimes they'll have the group number and okay. um, I know that there, there are some vouchers that come in that or yeah that come in and they have the vendor number but they don't include the group number and so <laughs> okay. that's, just ask and then I also want to point out, Melissa said feel free to give her Ellen a call, but if they're not available, I'm available also sometimes. So you can also check with me. I have access to the same system. Don't want to slow anybody down too much. Okay, the contract number. There's a slide on there for the contract number, number four. Um, the coding. This may expand into several of the handouts today that we had Janet send out. <clears throat> but each division has their own coding. 
There's a separate file for uh, each of the divisions. That's probably speaking about this? Yes. Mm -hmm. And just using this as an example, right now, for normal day-to-day -day operating expenditures, you would code to the current federal fiscal year, which we're in year 12 right now. It started on October 1st. And so we'd be where you can see where it says client services right there. That's not an administration one, but right above the word client services, look at that. 5016 service PO, the bottom line right there. Even though most of you probably wouldn't code to this, this is one of Janet's. And uh, that would be the 01 at the end of that 520, then four spaces would be a 02 for, a, for an administrative expense starting October 1st of the every year. Now, client services, that changes usually when we run out of money, and we never know when we're going to run out of money until we're out of money and then I tell Eric or Bernie and then, then it's like a fire drill where everybody's just trying to get the VR faces switched around. Ron is switching coding around for me. They know the drill. <laughs> <laughs> so, so for your client services, those won't change fiscal year until we tell you we're out of money. And uh, just for now, I know in... Uh, Let's say rehab services, for example, in 2011, we have federal only. And for administrative expenditures, we're, our, we're already going to FY12, but for the client services, we're still doing the 2011 federal only. Where SBVI, 2011, we're totally done with 2011 money, and we're in 2012 for both administration and client services. Now, I know sometimes this gets confusing, because it gets confusing to us, even the ones that are trying to decide where to code it to. So, don't ever be, don't ever feel feel afraid to give us a call, and we'll uh, try and get you the right coding. Um, on the IL Part B for rehab services, 2011 is completely done, and 2012, of course, is at the 90/10 match rate. For SBVI, the IL Chapter Two, 2011 is totally done, also, and the 2012, we're doing the 9010 completely right there, also. So that's kind of where we're standing on the coding. Now, there's another handout that I got a couple places on there, Eric. It might be in her, on the very bottom right there, it says expense codes. Oh, yeah. And here's where you figure out those four digits in the middle. They're not quite in the middle, but pretty close to it. And uh, you just pick out the one you think is proper on here. If you have any questions, you can give us a call on that. Um, what do they commonly use? Do they use a lot of grants? Or for the administrative ones, they'd be like the office supplies and yes. utilities. And I think you guys have vouchers already made up for most of those. Mm -hmm. If anything comes up with a question as I'm going on here, make sure you get us get it asked. So let's go back to that original voucher there. Um, while I'm doing okay. that, yep. that that ex, that expense code sheet right there, right? That is one that I have, and I've got a short list of. Um, uh, desktop references, and that's okay. a good one to keep around along with the coding structure. Um, that's that's always a sheet that I have. And, and like a mini list. I've just got like five or six documents that are just specific to SBVI, for instance. Um, that and that's then that's one of. Actually, that one's not specific to SBVI, but um, that's that's a document that I use use often. So. Am I on the right document here? No. Yeah, just a little farther down the page. Okay. Oh, you want me down here? Sure. Okay. <laughs> so we just basically went through five and six, the coding of vouchers as far as um, you get your main coding from that coding structure, the department coding structure. Um, the middle of your account field comes from that listing of uh, codes that we gave you. Um, like Eric said, if you have just a little mini chart that you make up for yourself, it must might be easier than 
this big two-page list. Um, the grant year, normally for administrative expenditures, it'll be the year that you're in, which is two. Um, for some of your client services, you may still be in the pre previous year or maybe finish up the previous two previous years. Just going on to the box number, or the number seven on this. Um, if it has a contract, make sure it's down there. Uh, some of the important stuff to put on there. Uh, if you don't have an invoice number up above that you put in there, an account number, if you have the account number that we have. Because when all this stuff goes out on the internet for the vendor to look up what they have or what is being paid to them, they are able to see their account number. They can see that field number seven. That's something that Melissa will enter. And so that account number is very important for them and as well as us when we're going back to look it up. We also have some uh, um, difficult items, we'll call them, where we're paying part of social services utility bill for a building. And if they don't know what account it's for, they have they don't ever give us credit, it doesn't seem like. We're fighting with the city of here right now, trying to get theirs straightened out a little bit. But uh, any information you have that's pertinent to the account, put it right down there and we'll get it right on the voucher when we put it in. Do we have that one taken care of now? Is it Not working quite. better? Well, I think it's working well now. Okay. But uh, we're going to go back. Ones. It took them a month and a half to get back to me, so. Oh. We're going to get back to them now. <laughs> and of course, your authorization signature. I know that uh, the VR faces ones are electronically signed, and these, um, whoever is authorized to sign, please sign here. And number eight. Okay, just going, I think that's about it for uh, AP and AP invoice. Does anybody have any questions on coding AP invoice? Where you get any of the information? Like I, I, said, I know that it is, well, it's recommended, I guess, or um, that when authorizations are signed, that they can be signed in blue ink. Um, just because the auditor's office likes an original signature, and sometimes when it's signed in black ink, they'll send it back because they don't think that it's an original signature. So if you have like a blue ink signature authorization, that would be great. They used to do the lick test over there, lick their finger, run it across, and if it smeared it was real, if not, then I don't, they must not, they must not be doing that anymore. They really did that, Lloyd? <laughs> <laughs> they did. I was the accounting manager, not the audit supervisor over there when I was in the auditor's office, so. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I only witnessed this. I, I never directed them to do it. <laughs> um, we've touched on vendor numbers before. Uh, if they're existing. If you think they're existing and you have a number that you've accumulated, um, go ahead and use that number. If you think they're existing or not existing, you want to check, make sure you give us a call. Uh, I believe everybody has access to W9 since I've seen them coming in quite regular, regularly. The uh, there's there's a couple different versions out there. It, it doesn't make it. Does it doesn't matter? Just no. as long as they get one and they get it back to, yes. to us. I think there's a DHS specific one that mm -hmm. has a return address to <laughs> yes. DHS. Yeah. And uh, um, but, but if there's another one that goes to another location, as long as as long as it gets back. Right? Yes. Yeah. And sometimes I mean, like I'll fax a one of our W-9 forms to a company requesting the W-9 form be filled out, and they already have their own, so they just fax their own, their own W-9 form, and it's that works something just Something that's well. already been filled out. Yes. Okay. Yeah. 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 Because, yeah. Yeah, we have the alternate W-9 for our department that Bureau of Finance and Management has approved for us to use, and that one has our own address on it. Yeah. Well, the, the nice thing about using that one is we know, uh, you know, like if it comes back to you guys, mm -hmm. 
um, you you'd let us know right away if they, if we're waiting on a timeline um, that it's back and that there's a vendor number where if it goes somewhere else we may not hear about that right okay then the W nines that we or the vendor numbers we do add usually take uh, two to three days to get through the system we put it on we have to send it over to them then they have to look at it and approve it and then it has to go through a cycle and so it could take up to three days I'd say. Any questions on vendor numbers? All right, let's jump into travel vouchers. Um, nothing's really changed on travel vouchers. The uh, vacant position will be doing the travel vouchers. Right now, we have a deal worked out with social services that Denise Trevish is still doing our travel vouchers. So some of you may be receiving calls from Denise. And then, or she may be working through me on a few of them. I've talked to a few people, not necessarily in these divisions, but more the DD division. But you can bring up uh, number six, or maybe two number sixes for the travel detail payment. I'm not going to go through this line by line or anything. Does anybody have any questions on their travel processing? If if someone takes their own vehicle, is it better for them to write the mileage down, or is it like I, like with my board members, I generally just use the the mileage sheet and do this one and just kind of estimate any additional miles like like Groton's not on here you know so I take Aberdeen to Pier and add 10 miles or whatever is should they be writing down their mileage or okay. or is the is the mileage chart okay I want you we want you to be reimbursed for everything that you have incurred as a cost with that said the auditor's office is not very flexible in allowing you carte blanche on your mileage. Even if you do write down the numbers, um, you're starting and ending mileage. What I would recommend if, if you're going to be doing that is if you're going town to town, it's not usually that big a deal. You know, maybe five miles over, maybe they won't do anything. But it's some of the individuals that we have working for us will go and make four or five different stops in a town, going to different sites, visiting different people, providing different services. And those people run up enough miles running all over Sioux Falls or Aberdeen or Rapid City that they may have to detail exactly where they went, otherwise the auditor's office will reject it. And one example is um, Bernie working on conference items a while ago, sent it out, kept his mileage and you know had several stops throughout Rapid City to get ready for the next conference and, and when they came came back, did his voucher, sent it over to the auditor's office. They sent it back saying, this is excess mileage. You know, it's this is what our list says it should be. And and so then we have to document where he went to within the city of Rapid City for them to approve it. So if you're going to be doing a lot of that running around town, you should keep track of where you go and put it on your travel voucher and keep your mileage and we'll reimburse you. And we'll argue for you with the state auditor's office if they choose to be argumentative and reject your voucher. But so, like, for example, uh, like that, that third block of information in there, it says Pier to Sioux Falls, um, and then the next line down, it just says Sioux Falls. What you would put maybe uh, Sioux Falls DHS to... Or from your hotel to... Meeting space. And then, and then make, make multiple lines within that same day. You could do that. Is that, is that what you you're want suggesting? To get actual, if you want to get the actual mileage, that's... Okay probably the best way to get it approved. Okay. And then you need to put your starting and ending mileage on off your car, correct? Right. Okay. I think even though um, you do just go off of the state list or off the map list as mm -hmm. the approximate miles, if you take your own vehicle, you still need to put down the mileage, correct? Yes. Um, this is Tegan Yankton. I have a no, question. 
Go ahead. Um, is Mary Richards still doing our travel or the fleet and travel state car? Yes, billing? she is. Um, <laughs> um, sometimes she'll call if I put like, or she sees a name that's not familiar or whatever. Does, do you need to put the state car mileage on your travel also, like from oh, a know. pool car? No. Nope. Okay, I didn't. Okay. I, no, that's okay. It's a good question. Now, if, as Janet was just saying right there, if you took your own car and just wanted like to take the, the map mileage, you would not have to put down your odometer reading. You don't, okay. No. But you do have to have your car license plate number on there. Yes, your car license plate number is very important. They'll send it back to that too. Mm -hmm. Seems like the smallest thing in the world. I don't know what they're trying to prove. <laughs> yeah. That you have a car? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes it's just easier to comply than argue and lose later. But that's required of everybody in every agency. It's not just us they're asking that of. Um, I also had included a blank copy of this, and I'm sure you all have access to that already, but that was in the uh, files that I had Janet send out. Another thing that's been, I'll hit my last bullet down here. Another thing that's been coming up lately, and I'm not sure if you guys would run into it. It's usually on a travel voucher, but we have quite a few people that have a job requirement of furthering their education or taking college level master's courses and maybe undergraduate courses for that matter. And, and we are paying for their coursework as well as their books. These individuals are buying their books outright and then submitting a voucher with us for the state to reimburse them. However, which they've never shown me the rule, but there is a rule supposedly that those books have to remain the property of the state of South Dakota. So any travel voucher where we're purchasing books for an individual employee has to have a statement that they understand that these books will remain property of the state of South Dakota. And I've had like eight vouchers sent back in the last month on that for people taking classes just starting in January. So if anybody sees any of those, just put a simple statement on there. And we've been fixing it through emails, but it's delaying them up to, you know, three or probably five, six days because they're going to the auditor's office, then getting rejected and coming back to us. I have to email the employee, usually attach a copy to their supervisor saying that, email me back this statement that says you understand these books remain property of the state, and they do that. And then we send that over with the travel voucher and it gets approved. So that's just something else that they've been picking on lately over there. There's no specific form they have to sign. They just have to note it on their travel voucher. Yep. Okay. And they're accepting emails of the same statement also, which is good for us. It speeds things up. Um, the travel vouchers, uh, thanks Peg for uh, noticing I didn't put the right file in there for you this morning. I had Janet send out another travel instruction, travel detail instruction. Um, these, those should come into our finance office here. And they still come here even though um, Denise is still helping us out. I anticipate maybe just a few more weeks of her helping us. But I uh, appreciate any help we've gotten from Denise. All the way that left has been super on helping us out until we get everything filled up and figured out around here. But send it into our central budget and finance, and uh, we'll either take care of it here or make sure Denise gets it taken care of. She's she always puts special processing on uh, not only the social services ones that she does, but ours for human services also. Denise uh, doesn't let them sit on her desk very long, so we're getting them processed fairly quickly. As you may have noticed, a lot of payments are coming quicker now. Um, the auditor's office backlog has gone from about six boxes down to one box. So they're usually within a day to two, they've got everything out of there, as opposed to 10 to 12 to 15 days the way it was before the uh, first of the year. Um, the... 
That's about it on the travel vouchers that I had. Did anybody else have any other questions? All right. Uh, one quick touch on the travel request form. Yeah, I don't know what that. Uh, so you think it says travel request? There we go. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We make a good team, Becky. <laughs> there you go. Show me what it looks like. All right, just uh, there's nothing really that's changed on this. I just wanted to touch bases, and I'm sure everybody knows this. Down at the bottom now, for out of state travel, the department secretary has to sign off on it. And that will probably be something that you guys don't need to worry about out in the field because it comes into here and then it goes to Grady or Gay or Eric or Bernie. And they get the proper signature on it, then they take it into the department secretary and um, justify it to, to Secretary Gill. But just so you know that these do go through the department secretary now. And every month I have to do a report of our out-of-state travel and after provider the travel request, then we make sure that she has signed them. And we've been doing very good so far. So we want to keep up that good work. And that's about all I had on the out-of-state travel request. And I'm sure um, most of you have worked on the direct billings. So we'll go on to the next section, the direct billings and procedures and approval for uh, motel rooms and I have one question going okay. back to this travel request. Okay. Yeah. I see you don't have anything filled out as far as general funds, federal funds, other funds, non-state funds. Is that something that you do not need filled out? Because I thought that they had to identify uh, we, what They may not source. know in the field. That might be something that we do here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. I see. So, yes, we should have that, but we'll do that here. I know that um, quite a few of the divisions, well, I know there's some of us, like Ron and I, that travel where we have to fill this out, but we don't put any bill into the state. It's all paid by a third party. And there's, I know there's more than that going around. So that's where we make the notation that no state funds are used for this. And uh, so for right now, out in the field, we won't need you to fill out that section. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'm going to let Melissa talk about the motel direct billings. Um, I'm sure most of you have worked with Melissa on this in the past. And uh, Melissa, feel free. Thanks. Okay. Um, I guess things are getting a lot better actually with the direct billing. Um, just make sure that on the when when you're sending in a, a, a request for approval. That um, that it is a four night stay. Um, if if there's ever a, ch a chance where like it's a two night stay for one person and they don't really have the funds or they would at want direct billing, I, you can always um, email me and and let me know and I can approve that. It's just. Um, the four night stay is, is our DHS policy. Um, every once in a while, as long as it doesn't get you know too too much, I can approve one that that's not to the procedure. Um, now, when you say four nights, it can be a combination of four combination, nights. Yeah. Like if two people went down and each person stayed two nights, as long as it's a combination of four nights, it, it will be yes. approved, correct? Yeah, okay. or if it's four people with one night stay, yeah. Just as long as you have four nights of lodging out Yes. There. Okay. Yes. Um, all direct meet, billing of meeting rooms will be reviewed and approved by um, myself or Lloyd. Um, and then I will send an email um, approving the, the stay um, it, it's it's requested that that we get the um, the request for approval prior to making the arrangements just to make sure that the hotel is in the accounts payable system because if it isn't 
then we're going to need a W-9 form and if the hotel you know, requires us to fill out an application for direct billing, we can get that done. Um, and that way it doesn't delay any payments or anything like that. Um, and also to make sure that the hotel does accept direct billing. But um, yeah, and then, I mean, like I said, everybody's doing a lot better. Um, just complete the written request um, and, and include the staff who are staying, the, the reasoning why um, you're going. Um, if there are any specific payment coding instructions, like um, let's say somebody has a specific coding but the director or um, wants it, um, coded to something different, um, let me know that also. Um, the, the dates um, and the division I, I need on those. Um, also, if there are any cancellations or anybody that that isn't going anymore or if the whole the whole event is being canceled, that would be your responsibility to do, and then just inform me um, of the cancellation so that way I can um, make a note and, and pull the, the approval letter. Yeah, just make sure we get that canceled with the hotel. Um, yeah. That could be one of our biggest problems when we don't show up and we have rooms pre-build pre or yeah. direct build. Yeah, and w the state doesn't pay for um, canceled rooms, so if a person forgets to cancel their room and we get billed for it, I'll be sending it to you. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see here. Okay. Um, yeah, and we'll only pay for the for the ones that have prior, prior approval. If we don't have a prior approval, then um, it'll be sent back to you. Sometimes, you know, we'll just Sometimes it's just that somebody gets really busy, they had the letter and didn't, you know, so I just request the letter really quick and, and we can get it paid, but, you know, as long as it's not a ongoing thing. Um, yeah, and then it's only approved rates, and right now it's forty six fifty a night. Um, you can, on, let's see, number six, there is a list of motels agreeing to state rates that can be found. Um, it, it lists the travel website and where of motels willing to accept the state rates. Um, as said before, it's important to verify prior to arranging any reservations um, just because the motel agrees to state rates doesn't necessarily mean they will direct bill. So that needs to be verified also. Um, we don't pay tax or phone calls unless they're work-related, and if they are, just um, make note um, or let me know in an email. Um, we don't do energy surcharges, movies, food. Um, food you can do unless it's, a, unless it's approved in the meeting room, but it's only for working meals at state per diem rates. And um, there's, we pay for beverages in meeting rooms, um, except for alcohol. Um, um, food is, is another big one. Um, just don't do it. <laughs> I mean, the, there are ways of finding, finding out. Um, just for example, one division rents the same hotel room or conference room as another division and one division has a hundred and fifty dollar conference room bill and the other one has two thousand dollars I mean you know it you, you can figure it out um, that that and um, anyway it that that's got a lot better too um, let's see here um, 
this we've already pretty much covered the the w9 form only if you feel that it's a a new hotel um if you have a new hotel you may need us to fill out a credit application to be able to get real direct billing i know we had to do that a couple times down in sioux falls recently yeah. so you can contact uh, myself or melissa to get that going um, another thing is that these direct billing instructions that we have here may be the their budget finances rules but your division may have other rules that you need to be aware of i'm not sure uh, maybe talk to Eric or Bernie about that. Um, well, and I, I think, um, you know, over the last few years, we've given more authority to, at least DRS has, given yeah. more authority to those district offices to set up their own direct bills. That's correct. We used to do a lot of the direct billing for the individual offices, but due to a um, number of cancellations and so forth that were happening out there, We've just asked every district office, like for fall conference, we asked each individual district office if they want to direct bill their rooms, that they need to be requesting it out of that office. And everyone's been really good about doing that and getting them into you, yeah. as far as I know. Yeah. So. Yeah, and people have been really good, too, about, you know, informing me of cancellations and right. people that... Yeah, it didn't go. And if you so. need a sample letter, um, Melissa has provided one as how to fill them out. So that's very helpful. Just use her format, put some names in, dates, motel, and just put it in attachment to her. And and it's also out there on the system, too. Right. And, and if you ever need um, a copy of the instructions or, or the letters, I can, you can send me an email and I can email them to you as well. All right, any questions on motel direct billing? Not hearing any. I'm going to cruise on to uh, the customer service section. It'll just take a few seconds here. Eric has bookmark. Really nice. As you guys heard, Grady, that uh, you guys are our front line out there, and customer service is the uh, utmost importance. And uh, you're our front line for uh, vendors also. You guys probably get the front line calls when payments don't get made or are a little late or a little slow or not as fast as they think they should be. So here what we have here is a vendor self-service page that um, it may be a little bit different link than uh, what I have on the sheet here, but it you can get there from the sheet here. I have it where you can look it up by the vendor TIN number, the vendor tax identification number, and the dollar amount. And if I could get Melissa to go ahead and enter that on the first one that I have on there. So any vendor that's a, that has a that is that's done a W nine with the state can use this What's website. The, I think you need. I don't think that's going to work. I think you need the. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that works. Does it work? Yep. On this one? Yes. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. And then the dollar amount um, of the amount paid, 336. Let me test it. Uh-oh. Okay, so you can either have our state assigned vendor identification number or their actual taxpayer identification number, which is usually a 4-6 number for companies within South Dakota. 4-6 dash something, so that's good to know. I didn't test it with this number, so that's that's good information for me to have also. So the this is a VR Faces document actually that came in, as you can tell from the invoice number. And um, this gives you that the, here's the invoice out there. It gives us the name, who it's for. And this is the same information that anybody, like Eric said, uh, any business can look at this. It's out on the state website. And most ve most vendors would know what their taxpayer ID number is. Yes. So, so this is the Avera St. Luke's vendor TIN up there. Yep. Is that right? That's yeah. the state's assigned That's number. That's the, yeah, the state's vendor number, assigned the, the eight, number. The eight digit one. Yes. Yes, okay. Yeah. So you can also use, like, um, their 
employee identification number yeah. in this <coughs> as well. Either or. And so and so the vendor would find the payment just by plugging in the dollar amount. Yes, and we can do that also. Okay. Yeah, but we if can we can give the that. instruction to the vendor to learn how to do this, if they don't yeah. know how to do it, we're ahead of the game. Yes. So that the, next thing, go ahead. The vendor self-service, do they have to, like, do, are there other steps to this? I mean, does the vendor have to log on to? Uh, Not on this one, but there is a section where they can log on. Okay. And at that point, they get a, they get a, Pin they sign the, yeah, they sign themselves a pin number. But all it takes here is just uh, it's just this website, and you plug in the the, the vendor tin and the dollar mm -hmm. amount. And uh, what if you don't have the dollar amount? What if they're waiting for numerous payments? And well, they'd have to look them up individually. But you have to have a dollar amount in there. Yes, yes. and and like sometimes a warrant, a payment for these will payments. have like several payments right. on it, so right. you have to total up the 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 full amount because that would be the amount of the warrant yeah i mean you have to know the the full amount of the warrant in order to look it up and then it would actually list every single payment that was made on that check i see and that'd be yeah. something that the vendor would sign up for and get a pin number they can put their their uh tax id number and their pin number in there and then they can see all the payments made to them then they can pick each payment and it'll list all 12. But we don't have that capability to show that. Okay, so this would be um, a good site if if support staff have someone contacting them and asking where's my payment. This would be a good site to send them to. Yeah, it's a good site, especially if people vendors are regularly calling wanting updates. This would be one way for them to check it themselves. And, yeah. The only bad thing is that it doesn't tell you where it's at in the process. Um. Unless you click on, um, well, click on that VRM. It'll just say, doesn't tell well, how long it's going to be or anything like that. There you go. Yeah. Being processed is all you can tell them. Yeah. Um, another another thing too is there. There's another page that looks identical to this. Only you put in the vendor tin number and then you put in the warrant number if you have a warrant number, and then it'll tell you the status of of the. Um, um, where of they... the check when, when the date when the payment was made and if it had cleared the bank or not but if, in order that's... to get the warrant number yeah. I mean, you can we have access Ellen to... or I a call yeah well they have access to that but what right. I'm saying is you know it, it has to have been completed and a check yes. cut in yeah, order right. for them to yes. know what and the warrant number is or anyone to know what the yeah, that's has more... to be made to be our faces for them to be able to see the warrant number that that is more for if if um, they're calling and saying they didn't get their check. Yes. If there's multiple multiple payments on a check and they're like, well, and DHS is one little bitty payment, and they're saying they didn't get paid, then we can look it up, mm -hmm. or Melissa or Ellen can look it up, give the warrant number, and we can say we can give the business the warrant number and say mm -hmm. it was paid on this warrant number. And it cleared your bank on this day. Yes, yes, and it's it's really really nice to use. Is there a um, it, uh, like on the home page or something of the vendor self service? Is there is there an instruction manual for for vendors to to use to? Mm -hmm. Want to go out there real quick? Just hit to back. BFM or yeah. no, just hit back a couple times. Well, there's well, a, well because I had them come straight in. I gave oh. oh, okay. Okay. Can you get there through the, the yeah. page? Okay. Yeah, you, you, you go to um, BFM. To, let's see here, state agencies. And then, let's see, right here, Bureau of Finance and Management. And then... It's down here at Vendor Self Service. There you go. And then you can choose whether you want to look up by number, look up by amount, you know, by invoice, or by payments. And that's the one that I usually go into um, to look up by number. And then that's when you put like the warrant number and the and the tin. But um, this is also where if they have if they provided a 
checking account to have direct deposit, the, they will send them a PIN number and then this is where the registered vendor login where they would enter their vendor number and then their PIN number and then they could look up. Is that only payments. for direct payments though? What if you usually you direct deposited if they give their direct deposit number or an email address actually an email address because um, then um, they'll they'll email them and let them know that their payments about ready to go through. But usually direct deposit. Yeah. What if you have some payment. that don't do the direct deposit? The you have a lot that don't do direct deposit. Yeah, yeah, we do. But. I mean, and it's noted on the bottom of the, of our W-9 form that, you know, if they provide, you know, their direct deposit information and an email address, then they would receive a PIN number so that way they can go ahead and um, look up their own payments and, and whatnot. But some of them either don't have an email address or they don't want to give out their information. So. Sure. But... I mean, it's it's really nice for us because, like, sometimes, you know, we'll get a phone call and somebody will say that they haven't received their payment, and I'll go on here and I'll say, well, it cleared, <laughs> you know, like, you know, such and such date, and I send them the information and they can either take it or not, and most of the time they don't call back, but, you know, but then sometimes, you know, it'll just say that, you know, it was sent, and if they didn't get it, then we have to go through a whole nother process so that way we can rewrite the check so but but for staff to be able to go out here and look this up um, are staff better just telling the the vendor to go to this self-serve page themselves or do you recommend the that staff go out here and and help them look it up it's pretty much up to them yeah if they're comfortable doing it and if they have the information to work with if the vendor can give them their their uh, taxpayer identification number and okay. the dollar amount they're looking for. But I'd recommend trying to get them to do it themselves. Right, save, right. Save you some time. Yeah. All right, let's see want to quick do another one just while we're in there. Okay. I just want to mention this is Judy in Sioux Falls and I use this a lot with my vendors and it's easy to teach them because they usually know their warrant number and their tax ID. And I show them that they can print the, the screens because they can toggle between the two. And it's just awesome. That it's like they uh, are empowered to know that they have this access to the, the website. So it's a, a very easy thing to teach them. Thanks and I never good. use dollar amounts thing. And if they use the pin thing, I don't even go there with them because usually what I find is the person that cashes the check never has to post it. And so I never teach them about the pin. I just go directly to the warrant number because if it's electronic, the number is different, but it still works. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. You want to go back to that first screen again, Melissa? Which one did oh, you? Well, I'll, I'll let you do it. I just had the, the link that Lloyd sent me. I just put it oh. easier. Go ahead and show them. Okay, here, here's, here's um, another. Another way, um, this is what I usually use, mm -hmm. is, okay. um, well, I guess I don't have the warrant number. Yeah, those aren't paid. No. Yeah, these yeah. are paid, but oh, I I don't I don't have a warrant number. You can get it off of there though. Oh, do so you not have that screen? Go back to the screen I was in. You can get it off of that. So you can get a warrant number off of here too. On that one, you have to go to. A different um, one. I gotta go back. Go to by amount. Look up by amount. Okay. Oh sure. Okay, and then the. Ten number here is one, two, zero. <laughs> <laughs> pen. 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 P
Thank you. And then, um, you know, I have, let's see, invoice number 1553848-0. And it was, let's see, the date I entered it was 1013. So we're not the only one the I see. So this is giving you a list of every invoice at that thirteen dollar amount yes. from that vendor, which was brown and silver. Okay. And this is the one that we're looking for. And it's been paid in full. So give us a check number there. And there's the warrant number. So, I mean, if you don't have a warrant number, you can go in this way in order to, to get it um, to verify. So now we'll have Melissa go through the way that her and Judy like to do it when they have the warrant number. Go look up by number, and then you put in their TIN number, which is that eight-digit number or their um, employee identification number. And then you put in the warrant number here. I'm having problems here. One nine. And then this one shows you the payment amount of the whole check, the payment date that it cleared the bank, and then the date that it cleared. And then it lists all the payments that were on this check. And then it also tells you what divisions or what departments were paid or paid on, were paid on this warrant. Okay, earlier when I was talking about it, it's important to put your invoice or your account number or some uh, mm -hmm. valuable information on there. If you don't have their invoice number in the invoice number slot, and they just have uh, all these people look like they did pretty good. They have their invoice number in the slot and they have the customer number. But if you leave those two. On something that means nothing to the company, then they have trouble posting our payment. And so, so where is that thirteen dollar payment? I don't see it. Oh, either. it's down here. I'm sure. Um, There's only eight thousand yeah. dollars. I wonder how many pages it is. Well, that came from multiple divisions, multiple departments, and exactly. And it was just one big lump sum payment, and that's. Right there it is. Oh, okay. My experience with vendors has been that's when they have those questions, when they get one right. huge amount and they right. don't know how to... Yeah. Yeah. So this is, this is really good right here. Yeah. Well, and then sometimes, you know, they'll, they'll just post it to another account because otherwise the money stays in limbo until you contact them, you know, when they're saying that you haven't paid them. And it's like, yes, we did, but... So, so then they got to go look for it. So a good thing to do is tell is kind of show them how to get through here and how to find the warrant number. Once they find the warrant number, then they can find this. Yes. The yeah. yeah, if they can't find the check. But the warrant number is also on the check, right? Yeah, yeah. If they get a check. This was an electronic right. payment. Yeah, payment. but the electronic payment number works just just as well right. as, as the warrant number. Yes. I think, was it Judy that mentioned that a lot of times the people she talks to just cash the check and they don't post it or vice versa. But um, individuals that are looking this information up, the state sends an email out on every payment, but that email doesn't go to the same person that usually has to post the account. It goes to the person that was in charge of the bank account, not the person that's in charge of AP. So they may not get a copy of the email. So a lot of uh, businesses or vendors may need some assistance in this. See, the other thing that they like is that you can teach them to print a hard copy by just going up to the tools up on top where the printer is. You tell them that they can print a hard copy and they love it because then they can take it to the person that's got the check and then they can start looking on their end. Yes. So those tools up on top, they, they can get the hard copy. All right. Any questions on uh, the vendor ser customer service we have through the vendor self-service? Which tools is Judy talking about? Well, you can just go to file and print. Oh, yeah, you can just go yeah. up to the, the toolbar. Okay. Yeah. I got you. But there's also on the other side, there's a little printer, like the antenna wave and some other features off to the right that's not on display here.
but that will work the file and drop drop box down to print but there's an actual little printer oh so I wonder if it's just not in the toolbox yeah all right the last thing we have and we've already touched on the pitfalls for the state auditor's office the personal vehicle, vehicle mileage and the purchase of books those uh, once in a while we get the wrong vendor on a payment and they send that back also but I'd say the bottom two things there were the number two or number one and number two items that I've seen come back in the last couple months um, I do have a copy of the state auditor's handbook attached we're not going to go through it but if you have any questions on where we make up our decisions or where they're making their decisions that's there as a reference tool for you that's they just had a training on it in the last couple months it's 46 pages long so Feel free to print it and put it into your uh, DRS SBVI billing manual in the back if you want. Did you have anything else, Lloyd? Nope, that's it. Um, does anyone have any other questions out in the offices, the state offices or district offices? Going, going, going. <laughs> okay, with that right. being said, Eric, do you have anything? Rhonda? Uh, you know, I, I appreciate uh, uh, Lloyd and Melissa and, and Ellen taking time out of their day to join us today. And, and uh, you know, if there's something that comes up, uh, something that you think of after this session, uh, feel free to contact myself or or, or Rhonda or, or any of these three and, and, and ask away if we can right. clarify something a little bit more. There was a, there was a bunch of information that was sent out uh, in those attachments earlier. And, uh, um, you know, I would, I would suggest, as we talked about earlier, just uh, creating some common uh, a folder on the common, your, your end drive uh, in, your, in your office so that you can all... Um, get get to those same attachments right and I will um, get clarification from Bernie on that and get uh, send an email out to you folks to make sure which drive he wants those put on but that's a good comment Eric made on that if that would work also too I'm going to get clarification for everyone on that um, private provider rate whether it needs to be the the $29 pre approved by Bernie Otherwise, the twenty-seven dollar and sixty-nine cent. I'll, I'll get clarification on that and get that sent out to you. If you guys have any other questions relating to any of the training that they had, if you have any training topics for the future that you really would like to see as addressed, please share that with us as well. Because we'll, um, as we said earlier, we're going to be looking at different topics over the next. Oh, here's Bernie now. He can clarify this for us I now. <laughs> I was just telling him I was going to get clarification from you. Um, one question was brought up about um, a $29 rate that is um, paid to the medical mental, mental, mental health providers. Um, the private providers, some of them still charge $29, and Ellen said that you had made a comment that you could pre-approve those on a case-by-case. I case could approve those on a case-by-case deal because the mental health, the, the private nonprofit mental health rule went down to that lower rate, but uh, <coughs> they're not available in all locations or not available to take the clients we're working with, right. and so are they wanted with that rate, so, and so we're not talking a big difference out there, so. No, but you do need to have those pre-approved before? Just send me an email on it. I use the CC um, on it. Okay. Um, and also there was, um, uh, they were visiting about where to put these handouts. Eric recommended a local drive in each office um, to they put They should their have handouts. an M common drive or uh, N rehab common or something like that. Right. Or they should be just save them out there and then make a directory for physical training. Right. Yep. Does anyone have any questions for Bernie before we sign off? The next one will be the Have you guys got third. any further on, on okaying purchases with the punch card? Because I'm waiting for paper to get approved. 
You're still waiting for paper? Okay. Well, this is my that second time around, and I haven't gotten it approved. It, I've been told that it's for Do uh, Grady to sign off on, and he hasn't touched it yet. And All right, I'm trying to figure out how that happened, how Grady got into the root loop, but uh, we're working on that. You know, if it's the paper you need, I mean, can they just use a credit card and get paper? Or go to the... They can go to the Office Max. They office Max. go to the paper. store, but I should... <laughs> yeah. Well, we're trying to figure out how okay. Grady got into that, but we're trying to get him to get out of there. But we haven't got it worked out with purchasing yet. I'll work on it this afternoon. Okay. Okay. Um, the next one will be the third Tuesday in March, which falls on March 20th. And um, as soon as we get a schedule lined up, we'll get that sent out to you and give you further guidance on that training. So with that in mind, I don't think anyone has any further questions. There's that uh, handout with DHS Finance contact information, so you can refer to that if you have questions about something specific. And that one was sent out just this morning. Thanks, Lori and Melissa and Ellen. Thank you, guys. Nice have a good to day. see everybody. Put your system on mute before you're done because it's going to stay on for another 20 minutes. I'll cancel it. Thank you.